Right, so I should start by asking, uh, do you guys know communication complexity? Yes. You all know. Ah, okay, so then this will be much faster. Okay, so uh, that's good. So, all right, so, so what's the difference? So let me just say, uh, what's the difference between asymmetric communication complexity and the normal setting? Okay, so, uh, you know, in the normal setting, it's more, most often, uh, you look at communication problems where Alice and Bob have roughly the same amount of data. So they, their inputs are usually comparable in size. That's not always the case, but that's usually the case. And then, asymm so, so asymmetric com communication complexity differs from this setting um, in some respects. Uh, one of them is that usually one of the players has a lot more data, so the, his input is a lot is a lot bigger. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to uh, tally the amount uh, of communication that each player makes, uh, in, uh, that both players make in total. So you know, so so we differentiate how much uh, you know the, the budget that each player has. So we say so. In, I'm going to use this notation uh, to mean a protocol where Alice communicates at most a on any path in the protocol tree, Alice communicates at most a bits, and Bob communicates at most b bits. Okay, so that's an AB protocol. Uh, another uh, another uh, difference that uh, you don't always have to consider this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna. So the the, the uh, another difference between asymmetric communication complexity in the usual case is that only one of the players needs to know the output. And here I'm arbitrarily going to decide that actually, after preparing all these lectures, I realized that most of the literature has it, has it the other way around. So, but uh, that's okay. So, so I'm going to arbitrarily decide that Bob is the only one who knows the, the, the output. So, okay, so, so what does that mean? So, uh, you know, a protocol is, a, is given by a tree, right? So we have nodes, and, uh, and at each node, um, each node belongs to one of the players, which means it belongs to Alice. That means it's Alice's turn to communicate. And if it belongs to Bob, then that Bo that's Bob's turn to communicate. And to each node, you have some associated rectangle. So, if, so, so maybe this is part of the tree. This is node V. And to node V corresponds some rectangle V, which is a sub-rectangle of you know, the space, uh, you know, the ambient space, the ambient sub-rectangle. If, if this is not, you know, if this is going too fast, then tell me and I'll define everything carefully. So, um, all right, and then, you know, Alice, uh, so, so, you know, so you have this rectangle RV, and now it's Alice's turn to communicate, so Alice has the rows, and she's going to decide some for some way of breaking the rows into two sets. On one of these sets, she sends zero, on the other, she sends one, and they go down the protocol tree in this way until they reach a leaf. Now, usually, the leaf has some label uh, L, Right, and uh, in this case, we're going to, you know, uh, and the thing is that so when both players know they reach the leaf, they know the output of the protocol. In the in this case, where only Bob needs to know the inputs, L would be some function, uh, you know, from from y to the output. Uh, and then you know, say you say the protocol is correct if uh, you know for every leaf, uh, for every input x y in the rectangle associated with this leaf, it happens that f of x, y equals l of y. Okay. Uh, so, so kind of, so it's, this is a slight, slightly different setting. And although I've, I've given, s I've put some trouble into describing this feature, I'm actually not going to use it because all the lower bounds I'm going to show are true for Boolean problems and for Boolean problems, you know, one of the players, if one of the players knows the, the output, he can just send it to the other with an extra bit of communication. Uh, okay, so I had a bunch of examples. Here's, uh, uh, okay, so yeah, I had a bunch of examples. Uh, here's one, uh, the indexing function. It's kind of very naturally asymmetric. Alice has n bits, and Bob has log n bits. 
uh, and uh, they wish to know uh, 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 the i-th bit. Or actually, I suppose that in this case, Bob wants to know the i-th bit. And uh, you know, so it's, um, it's easy to show. Well, OK, so, so, so let me denote by this notation the deterministic communication complexity of f. Uh, so the deterministic communication complexity of indexing on n bits can be, well, I'm going to show, well, it's at most log n by log n plus 1. And then there's a very easy proof, just a warm up that it's at least log n minus 1. And there's probably, this is probably tight, but I couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, so, OK, so the upper bound is very simple. Bob sends his bit. Alice sends xi. That's log n plus 1. And the lower bound, you do it by a fooling set. So if you've done communication complexity, you know. And what's the fooling set? Well, it's, let's say it's the set of all strings 0 to the i minus 1, 1, 0 to the i minus to 0 to the n minus i, i. Uh, so this is going to be our fooling set, right? So, so why is this a full? So this fooling set of size n, OK? And uh, why is it the fooling set? Because given any two strings, any two pairs, x i, x prime, i prime in S, uh, you know, in the, the indexing of each of them is 1, always, because i is pointing exactly to the i bit, right? But, um, but if I, if I so, so now suppose I have a rectangle, right? So I have here x, x prime, and i, i prime. You know, I in this so this set has size n, but you're scratching your head, so maybe I should go slower. So that, no, it's fine. So this set has size n. So if I do let log n minus one bits of communication, I can always go down. So as I go down the protocol tree, it, I just keep whichever sub rectangle has highest intersection with s, right? And and uh, so so I always save half of the total intersection of s that I have to begin with, and for starters, it's entire s, which is n. So once I reach a leaf, I know that s, the, the intersection of this rectangle RL for this special leaf that I've chosen must have at least two, two inputs, right? So let's x on i and x prime y prime be those two inputs. So I have some rectangle which includes these two. And it's a monochromatic rectangle, or at least, yeah. So I guess I can assume that because it's a Boolean function. So it's a, mo it's a monochromatic rectangle. And, um, and, and here's what happens. Uh, it has to be a one rectangle on one, on one hand, because indexing of these things is one. But the indexing of these things is zero. Oops. So OK. So, so, so I, guess I, I guess this shows that I need at least log n bits. And plus one, because we have to output zero or something. But it would be plus one up under logarithm. Why is it plus one? Where do you get plus one? Uh, yeah, because so, so currently you have constructed, so you have shown that there are n leaves where you, the output is one. There should be at least one leaf where the output is zero. So there should be at least n plus one leaves in the tree. So with that, this program plus one. Oh. oh uh. Maybe it doesn't work. So it, it surely works in, uh, in normal state. Maybe it doesn't work in zero. Have I shown that there are n plus 1 leaves whose output is no, but, but you 1? Have shown that each of your input, so you oh, that's right, that's leaves, right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, fair enough. Oh, good. Ah, beautiful. OK, so that's, that's how you show it. OK, so it's completely tight. Wonderful. All right, so. OK, so all right. So now there is some connection between this and data structures. Let's do that here. And it's well known. And uh, I think the first paper that uses it extensively, so maybe not, maybe not the first, but the first that I know, 
is by Peter Bro Milderson, Noam Nissan, uh, Shmuel Safra, and Avi Vigderson. And it's called On Data Structures and Asymmetric Communication Complexity. So most of these uh, two lectures are going to be stuff that's based on this paper and not necessarily from this paper. And, and I, whenever I part from it, I will, I will let you know. But okay, but this reduction, so, so okay, so, so let me define then what I mean by data structure problem. Right. Sure. Oh, can you check? No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, good. Uh, all right. So, so what do I mean by data structure problem? Okay. So, definition. A data structure problem. I define it by simply a function, uh, which takes as input some data and a query and it gives some output, okay? So that's it. So, so D would be the set of possible values for the data. Q would be the possible set of queries that I might want to know about the data. And O is the output of the function. And I'm going to give many examples so that this is clear. And we're going to say something about almost all of them. So here's the predecessor problem. Predecessor problem, uh, and I, and I prefix it, uh, and I suffix it with two parameters, m and n. So um, so we wish to encode a set, encode a set S, uh, which is a set of m bit strings. OK? Um, so, that I can so, so that I can answer queries. Uh, so a query is a uh, is an m bit string, and the, the query is of the form give me largest uh, x in s, uh, which is smaller than q. In other words, give me the predecessor, give me the predecessor of Q in the set S. Okay. And I guess that so this example of something I might like to do now, I'd like to also define very precisely what it means to have a solution for this problem. Okay, so so then I can talk about solutions. I, I might have I maybe should should have okay, so so this is an example and I'm gonna give more. But but let me tell you what a solution to the problem would be. Or, or maybe not. Or may, maybe maybe let, let me not do like that. Let, let me do it imprecisely, and then I will give you a precise definition. Okay. So, so here's a way of solving this. Uh, of solving this. Um, I'm going to encode. So, so I'm going to encode S. So the encoding of S is going to be a binary tree, okay, where the leaves are the elements of S. And at each node, at each node in the tree, I'm going to give you this, uh, let me see if I'm not making a mistake. I'm going to give you, I believe, the, this guy. So it's the smallest uh, right, or let's say it's the leftmost uh, uh, element x in s in subtree. So I, right. So where is n in your in your formulation? So you oh, good. Thank you. Sorry. Of size n. Oh, so size of s is n. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So this tree has n leaves, and uh, so it ha it has n leaves, and so it has size uh, less than two n. Right, so I can so I can encode this tree by a word uh, where I have two n uh, uh, elements or uh, letters in the word, 
and each letter is going to be the label so so each so each letter is going to be the label of of the corresponding node uh, so that's going to take m bits so i have m bits m bits here right so so this is an encoding and if i have this word uh, and i want to solve this predecessor problem i can just do binary search on the tree right so i i go to the position you know i go to the position that corresponds to the root that's probably the first position and i see uh, or maybe not the root, but I guess I'd be interested in looking at this guy so that I know if I should go right. And I see, is this guy smaller than Q? Right, this should be ordered. I, obviously, I kind of forgot to say that, but I hope we all assumed. This should be ordered. Uh, so so, so these, these are the, right. Uh, so so I, go, I look up this cell here, and I ask, is this guy less than Q? If it is less than Q, then all the guys to the left are less than Q, so I don't need to look at them. So the predecessor, it's either this guy or some guy in front of it. And now I'm here. And now I ask the same about this guy. So is this guy less than, and so on. So I do binary search on the tree. So that means that I can solve this problem. So by, by encoding it into a, a word which has, two n, which has two n letters. Why do you need two n but not n? Uh, is it n? So, so I guess I have n here, and then n plus n plus 2 plus n plus 4. I want to encode the entire tree. Oh, I guess, oh no, I guess I don't need anything on the bottom, or do I? No, I need to encode s itself, I suppose. Or maybe I don't. No, I guess I do. I do, yeah. I'm not sure I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Ah, so you shall use the loops. You cannot uh, output the result just in the node. Uh, oh, I can, of course. Yeah. Uh, Looks like, uh, I just do comparison. It's silly. I just use the leaves, right? I can just do binary search. I just do comparison. I don't uh, know why. I, I guess you should just take binary search tree, and then binary search tree you don't need uh, the leaves. Right, the right, right. So Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Right. I guess. I guess the reason I'm thinking about this leaf, this tree. There's a reason I'm thinking about this tree, but maybe I've simplified the problem well, and I don't the, need the, the tree. The reason is that uh, it looks nice for protocol. Uh, maybe, yes. No, I, no, actually, that's not the reason. So the reason is that usually there's a labeling, uh, a binary labeling of the, of the leaves, and then you want to know the bit of the label. But I've kind of removed it so that, but, but okay, but you're right. So, so actually, I just stored it as a sorted array. I do binary search on the array. So, so that's log n. That's log n. Okay. Uh, all right. And okay, so, so, and, and, okay so, so what, what I'm going to say, whenever I have something like this, so I have a scheme. So I have a scheme for this data structure that uses n letters, where each letter uses n bits, and the amount of time that I'm going to use is, in this case, log n. Okay. So I have I have a n m log n scheme for this data structure problem. Can you say again what the first, the second, and the third word stand for? So this is the size of the word that I'm using. Which it, so it's, a, it's an n-long word, and I, I'm going to forget about constant factors here. So it's an n-long word where each letter is n bits, and I, I take time log n. Okay. So, so maybe I should now take some time to define what I mean by this, and then we look at the other examples. Okay, uh, okay so, so what's a scheme? So a scheme, a scheme for a data structure problem f, <coughs> Uh, is going to be some encoding function. Okay, so I'm going to encode the data in some uh, in I'm going to encode it as a string of length s. So so let me give, give you the parameters. So it's a s w t scheme so i'm going to encode the data in some word of which has s letters each letter has m bits or or you can think of it as a, i don't know, i have s registers and each register holds m bits okay and then i have for each query for each query uh, i have i have a, uh, let's say, decision tree uh, 
um, I have a decision tree where each node is labeled, or non-leaf node is labeled by uh, some number in S. So I have a tree, right? And this and and uh, and this node is labeled by i, meaning that if I reach this point in the tree, I'm going to query the ith, the ith position in my word. Okay, and then the fan out of this tree is two to the w. So I look at the ith position, I see what it's there, and then I continue. Now I look at the jth position, I see what it's there, uh, and I continue and has fan out. The W. Now the leaves, the leaves in these trees are labeled by elements from from my output. Okay, and now the property that I want is that uh, you know for every uh, for every uh, data D and for every query Q. Uh, running uh, running running the corresponding decision tree T Q on the encoded data outputs F of the Q. Not, so this is the formal definition. I so, so, but, but the intuition is this. So, so I, I, how do I solve it? I find a way of encoding it. And, you know, so I'm, I typically, I'm thinking that, you know, typically I might like that um, uh, a word from my, an element from my universe, which would be this m bit universe, should fit in, the entire, in a single position in memory. It's kind of how I think about it. And now for each query, and now I see a query, and I should know how to probe the memory in order to find my answer f of, of, of dq. Okay, and uh, okay, so, so the height, so t is the height. So t is the number of probes, and it's the height of tallest tree. Uh, Right, so this is the form. So, so, uh, so let me give you more examples. Oh, so so let me tell you some some more things. So, so we've so we have this scheme here. It's actually possible to use. So, 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 so th the history of this problem was that at some point people figured out how to use uh, how to do this more effectively because you know we're kind of not using very well the fact that we can hold one of these guys. Uh, on every cell of memory, and they found a smart scheme uh, called fusion trees, uh, which attains these parameters. So, so it turns out you can do it in square root of log n. And people for a long time believed, uh, and, and soon at some point there was a lower bound of log n to the one third, and people kind of believed that this lower bound would be possible to be improved to square root of log n, and that's what they believe. And uh, and until in some, let me see if I see the time, the, the year, until in 2002, uh, Beam and Fick uh, showed that you could actually, they improved this to a square root of log m by log, sorry, log n by log log n. and prove the matching lower bound. Okay, in the third lecture I'm going to try and prove this lower bound by an easier proof than the ones that, than the proof that they had. Uh, so it turns out it's possible to do something much more clever than this and I don't uh, actually know how it's done so I actually haven't seen it. But, uh, okay. So let me give you more examples. Okay, uh, okay span problem. Uh, span. 
parameterized by some number n. So I want to encode uh, encode some 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 n so some matrix which has n columns and n by two rows matrix uh, over let's say the binary field F two okay and the queries so and the queries so the query set so I I, I give you so I'm given a vector an n bit vector and I want to know uh, is uh, is this n bit vector in the kernel of the matrix Uh, right, in the kernel of the matrix. So you can think of this problem as I have some subspace of F2 to the n of dimension n over 2 or maybe less. And, and I want to encode this subspace somehow so that I can, I, can answer, I can answer given a vector whether this vector is in this subspace or not. For any such vector, so let, let's just take, you know, so I'm only going to, let's say we're only being interested in sub subspaces that have dimension exactly n by 2. Then the rows in the matrix are linearly independent, and I want to encode this somehow so that I can answer this quickly. And, uh, right, uh, so, so this subspace is going to be the kernel of the matrix. And it turns out, so, you know, the only scheme that I know is the trivial one where you read the entire matrix, you multiply it with the vector, you see if it's zero, and that's it. That's the only scheme that I know. And we're going to show that, that no, we're not going to show that it's optimal, we're going to show something which is really unsatisfactory and no one can do better. But we're going to show the best known lower bounds, or close to that, for this problem. So let's span. Uh, okay, here's another one. So it's a partial match problem. Uh, so I have two parameters. Let's see, n and d, d and n, d and n. Okay. So 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 I have a set S of d bit strings. D uh, and it has n many, I think. I think that's the one. Oh right, sorry. Definitions of it earlier. So right, and I want to know, okay, so now, exactly. And now I'm giving you, uh, now the queries is a, the set of patterns P. So I'm, gi I'm given a pattern, 0, 1, star, uh, to the D. Okay, so D is that I mentioned. I'm given a pattern. And I want to know, uh, uh, does there exist some string X in S that matches the pattern? Uh, Meaning it has zero wherever p has zero, it has one wherever p has zero, uh, has one, and has anything wherever p has star. Okay. And again, the only algorithm I know for this is you read the entire set, you go to a strings one by one, and you and you you check. So this will require you know so so the best so best best known is a. Uh, I should qualify this statement, but uh, best known is uh, an ND1 uh, ND scheme, best known. And we're going to show a lower bound of uh, S, uh, W, well, D, R morally, uh, approximately D. Uh, okay, using, and all these things is using a symmetric communication complexity. And here it's a similar thing. So the best known is something like n squared. Uh, and we're going to show a lower bound of n uh, by log n, n by log n, morally as n. Yeah. What's S in the lower bound? Sorry. Uh, you know, if you give me some scheme, n w, let's say it's 1, just for simplicity. I'll, I'll like precisely give you the lower bound later, but yeah, I'm wondering what, what is S? S is the space, is the number of cells that your encoding occupies. Each cell has one bit, so it's the number of bits of the encoding. 
and I'm going to be, and here is the same. It's Yes, 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 yes. Yes, and it's the same thing here. So, right. so, so we can prove, and this is kind of the best that you could hope for. So, you know, the log of the size of the query uh, universe, of the, query, of the query space, divided by log s is kind of the best we know how to do using these asymmetric communication results, complexity results. And all right, uh, and uh, because basically Bob, uh, we'll, we'll see why. Okay, so we'll, we'll get there. I'll, I'll say that later. Okay, so there's also the sparse reachability problem. Uh, I'll just tell you just to give you another example, sparse reachability, and this one is a really uh, hard problem. Uh, so you know you have a sparse graph over n nodes, and you want to encode it. So so encode. Encode sparse graph and on n nodes, uh, and then the queries are uh, directed, so sparse directed graph, and then uh, and then nodes is is there a path from i to j, a directed path from i to j, and you want to encode. So, you know, of course, you could encode the entire uh, closure. You could encode the entire for every i and j, but you want to encode this, let's say, in order n or order n polylog n bits. And then this is really difficult. So apparently, the best the best known is actually you basically traverse the entire graph. Well, maybe there's some improvements on that, but uh, and now, but now the shocking thing is that the best lower bound known is something like uh, s. Uh, I don't remember exactly w, but it's going to be. It's going to be something like log n divided by log of s w by n, I think. So it's not even logarithmic. Or maybe log n, we can do log n by some other. No, no, that's for dynamic problems. So I think this is actually the best known. So the, you know, the difference between, and you know, the, uh, this best lower bound known and the best upper bound known is like, uh, you know, like, uh, let's say, n or order n log n or something and then you need to do n log n basically you need to read the entire thing that's the best known best scheme this is the best log so the gap here is actually it's terrible right you know it's a huge open problem to improve this to log n squared of course communication complexity won't do better than this because Bob, well, because the size of the query of the query space is going to be small. Well, let, let's look into that. So, okay. So, but this is kind of data structure. This is very, very down to earth problems. You know, you want to solve them or show that you can't solve them. We have many solutions for all of them. We'd like to prove lower bounds, and there is a way of proving lower bounds for these problems using communication complexity. It naturally gives you some sort of a symmetry, and so let's look at that. So let's look at the connection between the two. Things. Right. Uh, okay. It's the following observation. Observation. Um, uh, okay. So. Uh, well, let me start by saying that if you have a data structure problem, there is a very natural. You. You. I mean, it immediately looks like a communication problem. The communication problem. Alice gets the data. Bob gets the query, and they want to know what's f of x, you know, data with the query. Right? Bruno? Yes? OK. So, and now, what I'm going to, I like, you know, and somehow intuitively, we will see that if you have a data structure scheme for this data structure problem, if you have a good scheme, it gives you a, a communication protocol with small communication. And the statement is the following. Um, if you have an SWT scheme for the data structure problem S, then you get a uh, you get a uh, you get a protocol, and I don't remember exactly the parameters, but let's do it. Protocol 
for f. Let's fill this in later, so I'll just tell you what the protocol is. So Alice has the data, let's call that x, x is the data, and Bob has the query, let's call that uh, q. Okay. So what's going to be their strategy? Alice encodes x uh, using the encoding from this scheme. Uh, the, this encoding is some word, some S long word with M bit letters. Okay. And then Bob is going to run the query tree TQ. So he runs the query, the query uh, algorithm, the, the decision tree for the query Q. And how does it work? So suppose that TQ asks to read the I position, the some position, position I. Then Bob sends I over there, and Alice sends back uh, the that value. Okay. So and now and they do this. How many times do they need to do this? Well, they need to do this t times, right? T times. There's t rounds of this of this thing going on. Okay. In each round, Bob sends how many bits? Log s bits. Right? And Alice sends back W bits. Okay? So then this gives us a. Uh, so Alice sends T times W bits and Bob sends T log S bits. Okay? So this is the connection that, that gives you all the lower bounds that, that we're going to look at. If you were to qualify, if you were to qualify this by the number of rounds, you would also add that this protocol happens to have t rounds, and we're going to need that in the last lecture. Okay. But that's it. And and we still have half an hour to go. That's good. So we're going to jump on to what I thought would be lecture two, uh, which is uh, how do you prove lower bounds for this thing? Uh, almost, not all, but almost all known lower bounds for this uh, go by a, a, a proof technique which is called the richness technique. Richness. technique. Which is kind of an asymmetric version of this fooling set, more or less. Well, of the large rectangle lower bound. And here's what it says. It says that uh, it's, it, it's following lemma. If, uh, if you have an AB protocol that correctly computes F, then uh, let's say, so f is, goes from, let's say, some set x cross y to, uh, let's say, 0. Let's say f is Boolean. It wouldn't have to be, but let's say it is. Okay. Uh, then uh, the communication matrix of f contains, oh, am I saying, am I saying this wrong? Oh, I, no, I'm sorry, I'm missing, I'm missing something. I'm missing the kind of, uh, well, it should contain a large, I forgot like an, uh, a very important property, but a large, so, so we're going, what are we going to try and do? So we're going to try and prove lower bounds for these protocols by, uh, by showing that if you have a short, a small protocol, it should give you a large monochromatic rectangle. And then we're going to show that such a monochromatic rectangle does not exist. Okay. So we'll contain, but we need a certain property. So we need, not all functions are, are amenable to this. So, so it contain, should contain a large one monochromatic rectangle. Rectangle. And this will hold. Uh, 
for any f which has a certain property. And let's call it, uh, so now I'm going to define that property. It, it, it's kind of intuitive. I obviously should have started by doing that. So, but let's do it now. Data structure problem, and uh, I guess I think this is kind of the least. So, uh, okay, so, so here's the property that we want. So we have a function f. Uh, let's say it's a Boolean function. And we, call, we say that this function is u v rich uh, if, uh, there, if, if you look at the, communica the communication matrix of the function, meaning I have this function f, I look at the matrix where the rows are x and the columns are y, and uh, I put a one, so in coordinate little x, little y, I put the value f of x, y. Okay, so this, this matrix is called the communication matrix of f. Okay, and I'm going to say that this function f is u, uv ridge if the communication matrix has u different columns, uh, sorry, u different rows, with v1s in them. Okay, so it's uv rich if there's a set of u rows and if I count, and on every such row in the set, if I count the number of ones, uh, it should be at least v1s. So it's, it's at, at least. So at least, good. yeah, it doesn't have to be exactly, but at least at least v once. Okay, so function is uv rich. If you look at its communication matrix, you can find u rows, and on all of these u rows, you have at least v once. They don't they don't have to be on the same position, of course, for each row, but there but there's many of them. And now what you can show is that if you have this function f, and this function f is u v rich, so it has many ones in this sense, then I can find the large one of chromat chromatic rectangle and how large it's going to be u by 2 to the a plus b cross v by 2 to the b large. Okay, so I have this set u of rows and I'm going to find a, rec a rectangle which is one monochromatic and the size of this rectangle is going to, is going to depend on the richness of the function, it's going to be u by 2 to the a plus, and on the communication complexing it's going to be this. Okay, and now I'm going to do a proof by picture, hopefully, I think that will work. u divided by 2 to the a plus b. That's right, and then v divided by 2 to the b. Right? And now you can start to think this, this is kind of interesting as long as uh, you know, the number of rows should be like the larger one, right? There should be like more rows than columns. So B should be comparatively small compared to A. So I don't care, it doesn't really matter that B is there because A would be much larger typically. But, but this is actually what you get and we'll see why now. Okay. So now I have to make a, okay. so in order not to flip, let me just, uh, so, uh, Alice communicates. Okay, Alice is easy. Okay, so all right. So so let's. So, so okay. So so what do we start? So we have this communication matrix M F for F. Okay, and it's U V rich. What does that mean? That means that there is U rows, and each of these rows has at least V columns. Okay. Now, Alice and Bob are going to start communicating, and they're going to split this matrix. Okay. So when Alice communicates, she splits these. So I just ignore basically the other rows. I don't care about them. Uh, so so I, I have this rectangle here. And Alice communication is going to split this rectangle into two. 
those rows for which Alice sends a 0 and those rows for which Alice sends a 1. Okay? When that happens, I just pick the largest one of them. So let's say it's this one. It's the largest. If it's the largest, I've preserved at least half of the rows. Okay? So if Alice, Alice communicates, I preserve half of rows. And rows begin by being u. Right? So that's going to amount in the end to 2 to the a dividing by 2 to the a. Okay. okay, so now suppose it was this guy, so I'm, I'm here, and now it's Bob's turn to communicate. Okay, so he communicates, he's going to split this guy, this, this subrectangle, into two again. And now here's what I do. I go to each row, uh, among the surviving rows, I go to each row and I look does this row have more ones on this side or on this side? Let's say, let they, let's say this is the zero side. This is the side where Bob sends zero and this is the side where Bob sends one. So if this row has more ones on the zero side, I call it a zero row. Okay? And then I look at the next row. Now suppose this row has more ones on the one side, then I call it a one row. And so on. So now I do this for every row. Either each row each row is either a zero row or a one row, right? So there are either at least half of the rows are zero rows or at least half of the rows are one rows, right? Let's, let's just sort the rows. Let's suppose that I just sort the rows. I first put the zero rows and then I put the one rows, okay? Then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, let's suppose, and now let's suppose that there are more zero rows, okay? So there are more zero rows, that means that at least half of the rows are zero rows, and that, that means that half of the rows have at least half of the ones on the zero side. Right? And then I let Bob send zero, and this is going to be my new subrectangle. I've preserved at least half of the rows, and I've preserved at least half of the ones in each row. Among the rows that I've preserved, at least half of the ones survives, right? Let me, let me do it carefully. If it's a zero row, that means that there are more ones on the zero side than on the one side. And that means that at least on this row, which is a zero row, at least half the ones are on the zero side. Can you just repeat uh, what does it, uh, the splitting by Bob means? So, okay, so what does the splitting by Bob means? Yeah. So here we're looking at, so we're somewhere on the, we're somewhere on the communication tree. And we're in a node that belongs to Bob. And we've kind of, and here's the idea, we've, we've zoomed in, we've, in this case we had zoomed in on this entire rectangle and um, we had zoomed in on this rectangle and, and we want to go down, so we want to reach a leaf. So once we reach a leaf we know that the rectangle will be monochromatic. And if there is at least a single one inside this monochromatic rectangle, it has to be one monochromatic. Okay, so... Um, So, so what I'm going to do, you know, so I, if I first start with a rectangle that has all the rows that give the richness property, right? This is a U, this is a U, th so the number of rows in this rectangle is U, and within each row I have at least V1s. I could have m more columns, but I have at least V1s in each row, right? And then I let Alice communicate, so I, that's what I did, and now the number of rows goes down by 2. It's clear. It's clear. And now I'm going to let Bob communicate, and the hope is that the number of rows might go down by two again, but, and w but I will still have the promise that within each surviving row, the number of ones will be at least half of what it used to be. I have a really stupid question. So what does this zero and ones uh, on the line? The you? No, no, no. Oh, this uh, one. Yeah. This thing, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, this is just a bit of sense. You have this rectangle, Bob sends zero for these columns and one for these. Yeah. And then you label by zero. Uh, you label a row by zero if it has more ones on the zero side. Okay. And you label it by one if it has more ones on the one side. Okay. And now you know that at least half of the rows are labeled by zero, say, or could be by one, but it's the same. So, so, 
If half of the rows are labeled by zero, then you know that half of the ones, ha sorry, half of the rows have at least half of the ones in, e in, their, in their cells on the, on the zero side. And so, you know, and, and so you go to this sub-rectangle. Okay, so Otherwise, if there are more rows that are one, you know that at least half of the rows have at least half of the ones on the one side, and then you go to this guy. So either this guy or this guy must have, uh, you know, you lose half of the rows. So we just build a message by hope by uh, checking the appropriate rectangle with much more ones. Yes, 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 yes. So, right, so, so if there are more zero rows, then we take, we let Bob communicate zero. If there are more one rows, we let Bob communicate one, and then we're here. But yeah, exactly. And this has divided the number of both the number of rows and the number of ones in each row by two. And that's why in the end you get something like this. Right? Because you let this happen and you know, assuming, let's assume that A plus B is bigger. You know, this number is smaller than you. Uh, right, so, so I guess that it's an AB protocol and F should be UV rich where, uh, you know, uh, two to the A plus B is smaller than you and 2 to the b is smaller than v. So if you have that, then once you reach the end, you have, well, I guess you always have a zero large monochromatic rectangle, but in any case, this is what gives you, so you're not? Yeah, so I'm wondering whether it's the best what you can do. So the right. best you know. Uh, it's the best way we know. I'm pretty sure it there's. That we are losing something on this. Right, we're losing. There are ones here that we're throwing away, of yeah, course. And it seems that we could, we could try to somehow make the notion of Uh, maybe ah, yeah, yeah. If you have any idea on all those lines, I'd be actually very interested. Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe it just doesn't work. Uh, no, 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 I have to admit, I have to admit that now you say it, it sounds like something you would obviously try, and I've never tried it. Yeah, maybe people try it. Yeah, so, so. Prob yeah. Well, maybe, maybe they tried, but they couldn't okay. get anything out of it, so they didn't publish. I don't know, but, but I'd still be interested, whether people tried it or not, I'd still be interested in making that work, because I'm actually very interested in these problems. <laughs> so uh, there's, I have a bunch of open problems in this, uh, in this, in this asymmetric, so I'm okay. But this is kind of one of the basic techniques, and the other is, it's called round elimination, and it uses rounds. And these, are, I think, are the only techniques we kind of have. Uh, not fair, so Patrasku has, has another one. And but Uh, like an asymmetric analog of discrepancy? That's a good question. No, I, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good question. Um, I don't know actually. Like the asymmetric discrepancy. I think people, you know, they maybe they haven't looked at this as much as they should. Maybe, but right. So okay. Uh, yeah. Well, okay, so hopefully, uh, if, you know, if you have a function, okay, so the f we're going to look at two functions, and this is going to be a problem for both of them. We're, b we're, both, we're going to show both that they are very rich, they have lots of ones on many rows, and uh, there are many rows with lots of ones, and simultaneously, they don't have any l large monochromatic rectangles. And this will give you a lower bound on their communication complexity. So, okay, so we're going uh, to have a lower bound communication complexity uh, based on the based on this on this on this lemma, okay. right? Richness lemma. This is rich exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I think is a good time to take a break. Uh, oh, it's still early, so maybe we can. Yes, Okay, so, so then I, I'm, okay, so then what I have, I have two applications of the richness lemma. Uh, one for the span problem, shows the lower bound, shows this lower bound, and another for the reach, uh, the, no, sorry, uh, for the matching, uh, for the match problem, partial match problem, which shows this lower bound. Uh, okay, let's take a break now, and those are, yeah, okay. Okay. So, all right, so now we're going to prove uh, 
these two, we're going to try to prove these two lower bounds. We're going to try and show that the span problem requires time, basically n, morally is going to be n. And, uh, and then the mm, partial match problem requires time d. Okay? And both of these things are going to be proven by this Richness lemma. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to show that the span function is very rich, and yet it has no monochromatic rectangles, unless they're very small. And, and that's going to imply that any protocol for it must be large, must have a lot of communication. Okay, so... <coughs> right. Uh, so we're going to show... It's okay. Uh, we're going to show... Uh, any A B protocol for span must have, uh, you know, either A is going to be at least n squared, or B is going to be at least. Um, N. Okay, so, so, so what do I mean by this? I give Bob an, a matrix which has n by two rows of n. So it's an n by two times n matrix. And I give Alice an n bit vector. And I want to know if this vector is in the kernel of the matrix. This Solving this problem, any protocol for solving this problem, is going to have that either Alice is sending n squared bits or Bob is sending n, or both, possibly. Okay, so it cannot happen simultaneously that Alice sends little o of n squared and Bob sends little o of n. This cannot happen. Okay, so and let's show let's show. Alright, so um, We're going to show that using the richness lemma. We're going to show, okay, um, right. You know, let's assume that. Let's forget any matrix. Let's assume that. Uh, let's only look at matrix such that the dimension of the kernel uh, is n by two. So M is an n by two by n matrix, which and this means only that. The uh, the rows are independent. The rows are related. so I have M. M is an n by two n by two uh, by n matrix, and I want that every row is linear and independent. And if that happens, then the dimension of the image is n by two. The dimension of the kernel is n by two. All right. And then we'll show that for this under this assumption. Uh, uh, the span problem, the span function, is, um, let me get this right, 2 to the n, oh, I'm doing small letters again, sorry, then maybe I do it a little bit bigger, is 2 to the n, n minus 1 over 2. So I have these many rows and each row has 2 to the n by 2 many 1's. Rich. And I'm also going to show that span, so this, this matrix, does not have, does not have any one monochromatic rectangle of size of uh, less than, uh, you know, so its largest monochromatic rectangle will have size at most 2 to the n squared by 3 by uh, 2 to the n by 3. Simultaneously, 
Right, 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 yes, uh, exactly. So, so exactly, there's no rectangle, no, sorry, which is simultaneously, right, right. So there's no, does not have any large one monochromatic rectangle. And uh, and that would show that that should show this right because um, so u is roughly like two to the n squared and uh, two to the n squared by two and then um, you know if if a and b if if let's say let's just look at a because b is much smaller so if a is less than let's say n squared by ten then I would have a rectangle of 2 to the n squared by 2 minus n squared by 10, which would be bigger than this. And if b is also less than n by 10, then I would have uh, this dimension would be 2 to the n by 2 minus n by 10, which is bigger than this. And that would be a contradiction. So, that, so, so if I prove these two things by the richness uh, lemma, I conclude this. Okay, this I get this floor on. So, so this is what I'm going to do. Okay. So, uh, you know, so, so let's look at this matrix. Let's try to prove it's rich. Uh, it's actually very easy, or, or fairly easy. It's just uh, it, we actually just have to count, because any matrix. So any matrix M, the dimension of the kernel is n by two, right? Right. It's so so the, the kernel of this matrix is a linear subspace, and its dimension is n by two. How many points does a subspace? of dimension n by 2, a subspace of f2 to the n, of dimension n by 2, how many points does it have? Exactly 2 to the n by 2. So all we're really left to show is that there are these many such matrices, m, where the rows are independent. Right? So that's what we're going to show. It's just counting. So how many, so, so, uh, so, you know, so how many, how many, M with linearly independent rows uh, do we have? Okay, so we have M here. So, so M. So there's, we should be careful, right? The, each matrix of this one is a row in the communication matrix. So there are two matrices happening here, so let's just not confuse them. So we have a matrix M. The matrix, each matrix M is an n by 2 by n matrix. Let's count how many there are. So we have to pick, we have to pick each row to be a lin linearly independent. So, so let's just pick one row at a time. Pick the first row, then the second row, and so on. And each row needs to be linearly independent than all the previous rows. Okay? So how many choices do I have for the first row? So basically, on the first row, I can pick any vector other than 0. Right? So I have two to the n minus 1 choices, right? And now, and now I want this row to be linearly independent, so that means that it should not be in the span of this guy. What's the, what's, how many points are in the span of this guy? Well, 2, right? Which is 0 and, this, and the, the row. So the number of choices for the second guy is 2 to the n minus 2, and so on. So, so you know, so once I reach the ith guy, the number of choices is... Uh, 2 to the n minus 2 to the i. Because, uh, well, well, when I reach, I guess, the i plus 1 guy or something. Right? Because I have to pick, once I reach the i row, I have to pick, a, in order for it to be independent of the previous things, it cannot be in the span. All, the, all that I require is that it's not in the span of the previous things. How, what's the size of the span of i independent rows, 2 to the i? So, you know, among the entire space, I have to avoid 2 to the i points. Right, so the number of matrices uh, M is uh, the product from I equals 1 up to uh, N by 2 of, uh, oh, uh, of 2 to the N, 2 to the N minus 2 to the I. So I guess equals, it's not exactly this, it's actually 0 and N by 2 minus 1, but yeah, by Okay. Uh, and just to make myself, just to get rid of that, it's certainly at least 
I'm only making my life a little worse. I'm increasing i, so, so, I'm, so I'm increasing this, so it's making it smaller. Okay. So at least this. Now, this number is certainly, so, so this is 2 to the n, right? This number is at most half 2 to the n, right? So this is at least the product of 1 of 2n by 2 of 2 to the n minus 1. Right? And also this, so I give you what I promised, 2 to the n, n minus 1. So, so span is rich. Okay, so now we have to show that it does not have a one monochromatic rectangle of this size. Uh, right. Right, so I'm going to erase this because this is the end part. So, all right. Uh, so, we, so, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to suppose we're going to take a rectangle. So 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 let's let's look at now now it's the communication matrix. So now now this is much bigger, right? So now this is going to be, you know, large. It's going to be two to this very, very many. So for, for each row now you have a matrix M. Right? So this is the communication matrix. And now I'm going to so so sup, I'm going to assume, suppose that I have a one monochromatic rectangle with these many columns. I'm going to show that it has fewer than 2 to the n squared by 3 rows. Okay, so let's suppose, let's let R be that rectangle. So we have R, this is the rectangle, and it's one monochromatic, and the number of columns is going to be 2 to the n by 3 or bigger. Okay, now I have to think what that means. That means that, so, so each column is a vector, right? So I have some vector, x1 up to x, let's do capital N. And this guy, each one is an n-bit vector. And uh, each one is, is an n-bit vector. And for every matrix, for every matrix which is a row of this sub-rectangle, this vector is in the kernel of the matrix, right? That means that uh, the span of the entire thing, the span of all these vectors, is also in the kernel of the matrix because the kernel is a linear subspace, right? So, so for every i, x i, for every i and for every matrix m in the in this rectangle, x is in the kernel of m, which implies that for every matrix m, for, sorry, for every matrix m, the span of these xi's is a subspace of the kernel of m. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Let v be a subspace of the span of xi with dimension of v exactly n by 3. Why can I find such a thing? If you take any 2 to the n by 3 vectors, the span of them must have dimension n by 3 or greater. Because if it was smaller, there would be fewer vectors. Uh, and so, you know, I just cut off however many dimensions I need until I get some subspace of the span of xi, and its dimension has to be exactly n by 3. Now v, now it's true that for every m, V is a subspace of the kernel of M. Now I have to think, so what does that mean? What does that mean about the rows of M? That means that the rows of M, so if this holds, this implies that the rows of M are chosen from V perp. Right? Okay, so now the question is, how many m, so, so we have a subspace of dimension n by 3, right? So that means that the dimension of v perp is n minus n by 3, which is 2n by 3. All right, and now I'm asking, how many, how many matrices m exist whose rows are both linearly independent and chosen from a subspace of dimension 2 to the n by 3? The number of such m is going to be 
equal again to the product. So for each, uh, so, so, you know, let's look at the first row of M. It must come from a subspace of dimension two to the N by three. How many, um, how many such rows are there? Where, well, uh, non-zero, uh, two to the two N by three minus one, right? Now I've picked sum, and it's again two to the N by three minus two to the I. So two to the I is the subspace of the previous rows that I've already picked. And now, uh, and now, you know, so this is at most, uh, you know, just getting rid, just ignoring this i, this is at most 2 to the 2 by 6 n squared, which is 1 third n squared, as promised. Right, so I've started by assuming that I had m many columns. I'm concluding that I cannot have many rows. Okay. That was much faster than I thought. Yeah. Right. Uh, right, so, so we've proven this theorem. Okay. So just an aside, so what does this say about the... So, so now let's look, use this thing and let's see what this says about data structures for the span problem. Okay, so if I have, and here's, let's say, so, you know, if I have a scheme which would be an SWT scheme, then this would give me, um, this would give me a TW uh, T log S protocol. But now I know that for, 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 eh? for span, and now I know that, so then I know that TW is, uh, is at least um, N squared or uh, or T log S is at least N, right? So suppose that, so if, you know, if W is at least N is less, is no more than N, okay, so if, if in each cell of, in each register of my, data, of my encoding, I can store less than N bits, then this tells, this tells me that T is bigger than N, and this tells me that T is bigger than N by log S. So in either case, uh, I get T is at least N by log S. Okay, so this shows, this shows that there does not exist a, uh, let's say, S, N, T, uh, N by log S scheme for span. This means that there's no encoding scheme for this matrix. So even if you encode, so, and this is actually optimal. So with this N here, this is actually, well, modulo this log S thing. I actually, maybe it's even optimal with it. I'm not sure, but forgetting about this log. So, you know, let's say that S is poly N. So we don't really, you know, so you, it's, which is reasonable. I ask, to, I ask to store this N by N matrix. I give you poly N space. That's very reasonable. So, um, so here's what this says. It says that, even if I allow you to get n bits of for per query, right? So for, for, et, for each probe to your encoding, you can get n bits, right? So you have an encoding scheme, and each probe allows you to get n bits of the matrix. Even then, I need you need time n over log s, which is actually optimal because, of course, in time n, if I can get n bits per probe, I can just read the entire matrix. So it's optimal for, of course. So, so, okay, so this, isn't, so this is what's known. Big open question. Uh, uh, can you prove, um, you know, anything like uh, S1 or, uh, you know, mega N schemes? 
can you prove any lower bound? Say I even force you, you only can only get a bit, I'm telling you, you can only get a bit per probe. Can you prove any lower bound that omega of n is strictly greater than n? Open, wide open. No one knows how to do this. Essentially because the communication complexity is the only technique you know how to solve this problem. And of course Bob can just communicate all the n bits, so you're never going to get a lower bound which is bigger than n using this technique. I'm, it might even be that just proving n without the log s or with better dependency on s could be f not known, so but uh, there I'm, I'm not so... You need to ask uh, someone else. Okay. All right, so... Okay, now, now here's... So now we're going to show the same thing for this partial matching, uh, partial matching problem. And we're going to do that by reduction from uh, set disjointness. So in communication complexity, set disjointness is kind of always a very important problem. And, uh, and let, me define, let me define what I, what I mean. So, it's, kind of, so it's, kind of, it's a version of set disjointness which is called lopsided set disjointness because the set in one of, the, of one of the players is much smaller than the set of, on the other player. And uh, Patrashko uh, ha has a paper, had a paper, uh, for where he showed that many results in the data structures literature all reduce to a lower bound for the communication complexity of set disjointness. So it's kind of a very nice paper. It's called Unifying the Landscapes of Data Structures Lower Bounds. And this reduction, and this reduction shows here. So, okay, so, so let me tell you what, what problem he's looking at. And then, uh, okay, and then, and then I'll tell you what he has shown and what we're going to show. So the lopsided set disjointness, it's actually nk. So here's the problem. It's a problem where, so Alice, so it's a communication problem. Alice gets a Alice gets a set so so we think we think of subsets so so we think of subsets of a universe of size n times k let me just make sure that's what I'm saying no sorry so Alice that's wrong so Alice and Bob each get n blocks of so each gets each get a string with uh, n times 2k bits okay so Alice gets n times 2k bits. So there are n blocks, and each block has 2k bits. OK, so it's a string of, of, of these many bits. I'm writing it top to bottom. And Alice gets one such string, and Bob gets another such string. Okay. So we have n blocks, 1, 2, 3, n, and each block has 2, 2k bits. Uh, and now the difference is that Alice can get, so let's say that Alice gets a subset where the Hamming weight in each block is n by 2, exactly. n by 2, etc. n by 2. So out of these 2k bits, not n by 2, sorry, k, which is the, the entire block by 2. That's what I mean. So out of these 2k bits, Alice gets exactly k of them set to 1. Okay. And Bob, on the other hand, only gets one bit out of these k. That's why it's called lopsided. So Alice can have a set of size n. Actually, Alice has a set of size nk. In each block, she has k, k, k bits, turned to 1. And, and Bob has a set of size n. In each block, he has one bit. This is, is the length of the entire input, right? So, so the entire, so this input, let's, uh, you could call it, you know, the Alice's input uh, is going to be a string uh, x n1 up to x n 2k. So Alice's input is a binary string 
with these many bits. You have n blocks, each block has 2k bits. The Hamming weight of each block is exactly k. Ah, it's a Hamming weight. Okay. Oh, this k, yes, yeah, sorry. This k is a Hamming weight. Yes. For this uh, string of length 2k. Of, okay. Right. For each, for each block of length 2k, Alice has Hamming weight exactly k. I'm not going to do a reduction. I'm just defining the problem. Oh, so you have a specific version of the joints. Right. It's, 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 uh, Petrasco calls it lop lopsided blocked set disjointness. Okay. So you divide it into blocks, and in each block it's lopsided. So Alice has much higher Hemingway than Bob. Okay. And, uh, okay. Right. And then we're going to show the following theorem. In any A, B protocol for lopsided blocked set disjointness, uh, we're going to have that either A is at least, I'm going to write it precisely, 1, 5, N, K to the 1 minus 2 delta, oh, let me just see, or uh, <coughs> B is at least. Okay, so let me give you, uh, maybe I should have done this before, so let me give you the trivial protocol for this problem. Or, you know, the kind of, uh, so uh, Bob sends his entire input. That costs him n log k. Alice finds out, sends the bit back. That's a good, right, it's a good problem. You can probably match this somehow, but I'm not sure entirely. So, so this should be optimal. But, but okay, so, so what this theorem says is that if Bob sends less than that, let's say he sends, a, instead of sending n log k, he sends a delta fraction of that then Alice has to send basically k to the 1 minus delta bits for each block. So she has to send n times k to the 1 minus delta bi bits. So that you're just testing if there are no ones that match up in those. Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> I should also define the function, but <laughs> Right, so, so, so what's this disjointness function? Let's call it n disjointness because uh, it's probably easier that way. So, so I'm testing, so what I want to know is, is there a coordinate where both of these guys are 1? Is there a coordinate such that th this guy is 1 and so they're both 1? x uh, uh, i j equals y i j equals 1. That's the that's the that's the lopsided set disjointness problem, and now the 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 in any AB protocol for this problem, either B sends you know a delta fraction of kind of what you know he can get away with, but if he sends less, if Bob so what I'm saying if Bob sends less than delta n log k bits, then Alice is going to have to send at least n to the k one minus delta. Okay. Right. All right, and this is proven. Okay, so, so let me tell you, so what does Patrashko do? So this actually follows from this, um, from this paper uh, of uh, Bro Milderson that I told you about in the, in the beginning. And he states that in the paper, but it's a bit, it takes a bit of work to get it, or at least it took me a bit of work to get it. Uh, what Patrashko does is he proves a randomized, he proves basically this, but ra for randomized protocols. And then his, and then whatever, and then he has a bunch. So, so the paper has two, basically two parts. It has a bunch of very smart reductions to this disjointness, block disjointness problem. Oh, sorry, it, uh, the other way around. It has a bunch of nice reductions from this disjointness. So he can show reductions from disjointness to this, uh, to various data structure problems, both dynamic and static data structure problems. And then he has a randomized lower bound for this set disjointness. With, and this implies like a random, uh, you know, a data structure lower bound for randomized schemes as well. And this in some settings is actually people are only interested in randomized schemes, so that's kind of important. 
And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one reduction from that paper to this pattern uh, partial match. So I'm going to reduce this jointness to partial match and I'm going to prove this theorem. Okay. So let's prove this theorem. And the, the theorem is proven by the, disjoint, by the richness method as well. Okay, it's almost what's here. Let me start by doing that. Okay. So, So I'm going to so okay so so first first thing disjointness or disjointness Oh no so it's not actually a non disjointness I'm going to do disjointness so I want to know I want to know if there is and, I, and then I negate that right so I want to know this disjointness function so if I have if I have a string a and a string b disjointness of a b is 1 if there does not exist uh, ij with x ij equals 1 equals y ij. OK, so that's, that's the string. So. And uh, OK, so let's show that. Uh, so, so first, OK, so first this jointness nk is. 2k choose, okay, so 2k choose k to the n, k to the n, rich. Let's prove that. That's actually simple. Okay, so take any, take any possible, so, so right, in the communication of this thing, communication matrix of this problem, here you have Alice's inputs and here you have Bob's inputs. Now take any Alice's inputs, any set like this, right? In each, in each block, you have k out of 2k bits equal to 1. That means that to be disjoint on this block, Bob can pick any of the k positions that Alice doesn't have. And if he does so on every block, then the whole thing is going to be disjoint. right? So for any input of Alice, I'm going to get k to the n choices for Bob's input that are disjoint with Alice's input. And now how many inputs does Alice have? Well, for each block she has 2k choose k possibilities and you have n blocks. Okay, so that's both. Okay, so now... Uh, right. So now suppose, you know, suppose... Suppose we have this AB protocol and let our R. So, 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 so then by the, okay, so then by the richness lemma, if we have an AB protocol, we have a rectangle R, which is a one monochromatic uh, rectangle. Uh, and let's say that this rectangle has C columns and R rows. This is a little r. C columns and R rows. Uh, and, and, and this richness lemma is, tell, is going to tell us that we can find such a one monochromatic rectangle where C is bigger than, uh, you know, 2K choose K to the N by 2 to the A plus B. And the number of rows is at least K to the N by 2 to the B. Right, so we have such a rectangle. Let, that's R. So, all right, no, I did it, sorry, it's the other way around, sorry. It's the number of rows, the number of rows and the number of columns. Right? Yes? So I'm assuming, so I'm assuming that I have an AB protocol and I want to prove a lower bound on A and B. If I have an AB, pro disjointness is blah, 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 it's this much rich, right? And I have an AB protocol. So, 
so the richness lemma gives me that there must be one more chromatic rectangle of this size. Okay? So, so let R be that rectangle that, that, that the richness lemma gives me. So that's R. And this is a one monochromatic rectangle, meaning everything which is, every row is disjoint from every column. Okay, now I have to think a little bit. So, okay, so, so, so here's, here's a claim. If you, have an, if you have a row A, a string A, which is disjoint from every column, then it must also be disjoint from the union of every column. Right? Right? So I take I take all, I have all these sets B, I take their union, right? If none of them intersect A, then their union doesn't intersect A. Okay, so let so so let let the string U be a string, it has N blocks and be the union of R's columns, okay? And let WI be the Hamming weight uh, of UI. Right, so of, for every possible B, which is a column of this rectangle, I, whenever there's a one in one of the columns, I just put a one there, and that gives me this string U, right? A must be disjoint from U, so it must avoid all these U's. Uh, it must avoid all the ones in U. Right, um, right so, 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 okay. So two things need to happen. First, uh, the number of columns that, the number of columns that I have must be no more. So, so any, string, any string B which I choose is a substring of this U, right? It can only have a one if U has a one, right? So, the, so how many ways can I pick? So if the Hamming weight of UI is WI, I must be, and, and, and all the strings, all, all the columns have only one bit in each block, I must be picking one bit among this WI, right? So the total number of columns must be at most the product of uh, the product of the WIs, right? WIs. Right equals one up to n. Right? On the other hand, the rows must completely avoid these WI bits on every block. On every block, on the, bl on the ith block, the rows must completely avoid it. So what does that mean? That means that the number of rows is at most so the product for i equals 1 up to n. So for each block, I have, I had 2 to the k bits in total, right? But now I must avoid wi bits. Uh, and now I must choose k among the remaining ones. Okay. Right, and now, so, okay, so that means that this number must be at most this number, and this number must be at most this number. Right? So let's do that. So, so, so let's see what this gets us. Right, so, so I have that the product of the WIs is at most, no, is at least, is at least k to the n by 2 to the b. Right? Now, let's suppose, by way of contradiction, that both b, b is less than this thing and a is less than this thing. Okay? So, 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 you know, this is k to the n, so 2 to the b is k to the delta n, right? So, or is less. So, so, so this should be at least k to the 1 minus delta n. Right, so because uh, right, if if b assuming assuming right assuming this, right assuming assuming that b is at most this and a is at most this, assuming these two things, then I get that k is 
All right, so what was that? What do I get? So I have a product. Oh, and I also know that also uh, wi is less than 2k. Is that correct? It's a, in fact, I can say, yeah, that would be not good enough. So I can actually say it's less than k. Why? is less than k. Because it must avoid at least one string, right? So, so I, have at least, I have at least one row. That row has k bits set to 1 somewhere. So all the b's must avoid these k bits. Right? So, so if, even if I take the union of the, of the b's, at best, they cover the remaining k bits. OK? So wy is less than k. All right, so what now? now I've written here, and we should look at carefully that so this implies then so so the fact that this is at least this this should and that the w is less than k this should imply that for at least at least n by 2 of the indices i We must have wi being less, uh, no, sorry, being at least k to the 1 minus 2 delta. Right? Why? Suppose, on the other hand, suppose. Suppose that you had n by 2 or fewer indices that attain this much. The product of this thing, uh, so, so then the total product would be, you know, these, you know, so all the, all the indices would have to have less than this, right? Uh, you know, you, you'd, have, you'd have at least, if this were true, so let me maybe use the other column. So if this were true, if, uh, or if this were not, so, if I, at most, n by 2 of the indices had w this large, then I could have maybe n by 2 of the indices that would reach k, which is the best that I could hope for, and then the remaining ones would be less than k to the 1 minus 2 delta. Right? So if now I'm doing the product of the wy's, Right, so that would mean that the product of the wy's would be at, at most k times n by 2 times uh, uh, at least at most, uh, well. k times n by 2 minus delta n. Right, uh, uh, it would be less than this, right? But so, so so okay, so so I forgot. I sh maybe I should put this exact number here. So suppose that I ha suppose that the number. Okay, let's do it like that. So maybe this proof isn't being very clear. So suppose that the number of indices which are bigger than this number is some value uh, capital N. Okay, so I have capital N indices uh, where capital N is less than n by two. I have capital N indices which are let's say no more than k, and then I have n minus capital N indices, all of them are at most this much, right? So in total, I have k to the n times, so, so then I have that the product of the wi's is less than k to the n times k to the 1 minus 2 delta times n minus n. Okay, now I think I've done it correctly. And uh, so, so this equals how much? This equals k. So I just uh, r r r r n minus n plus one. So it's k to the n, right? Uh, so this gets k to the n, and then I have minus um, uh, two delta n minus n, but this number here is, uh, so n is less than n by two, that means that this is, this number here is bigger, this number here is bigger 
than a half than n by 2, right? So this should be smaller. That's my guess. It should be smaller than k to the n times 1 minus delta. That's, that's, that's it. Right, so if n is less than n by 2, then this number is bigger than n by 2, which makes this neg ne negative less than, which makes this, uh, less, th this thing less than n by 2, uh, this, this entire thing less than n by 2, times delta. So I get that. Sorry. K to the n, and then you you're multiplying by k, and then you're dividing by k to the 1 minus 2 delta, so you're going to, you're net multiplying by something bigger than 1. Does that? I didn't know, I'm sorry, I did. that right? it I, I'm sure you did, but I didn't follow. If you increase n, then you kind of move uh, uh, multipliers from the uh, right side to the left side. If you increase n, so so the point is that so you have capital N uh, multipliers equal to k, and you have uh, all the rest mul uh, multipliers equal to k to the one minus two delta. At and most, if you increase k by one, then you just move one multiplier from the right side to the left side, right? Increase n. If you increase n by one, you move there. You can increase it. Right. Exponent uh, of this expression is linear on the gain, so it's monotone. Yeah. Right, yeah, but it's, uh, it's, mono, um, it's monotone on the increase. Yeah. Okay, that's right, sure. Okay, so, so um, right, this thing is at most n by 2, is that how we do? And this thing is at least, uh, no, sorry. Right. So the point is that this thing here, if I'm assuming by contradiction that the number of these indices is less than n by 2, which means that this is at least n by 2. Right? If this is at least n by 2, this thing is less than uh, n delta. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Which is a contradiction with this thing. Okay. Good. Sorry. Maybe you've like well, seen it long ago. <laughs> so, but okay. Uh, all right. Good. So all right. So so now we must have maybe I shouldn't. So so now we have at least n by two of these indices must actually be fairly large. Right, so it means that for at least half of these blocks, the uni these UIs actually have quite decent Hemming weight, like k to the one minus two delta. Okay, so now, uh, now, uh, okay, so now what we'd like is we'd like to bound the number. Um, okay, so so now we this kind of solves the columns, and now we're going to use this this inequality for the rows. So let me rewrite this. It says that. So, so this is at most that, which means that 2 to the a plus b uh, is at least, uh, let's say, the product for i equals 1 up to n of 2k choose k divided by 2k minus wi choose k, right? Okay, so, so, you know, so what is, so now, you know, now I'm really just going to calculate this thing, so I don't really have, uh, I'm just going to calculate it and it turns out that a plus b is big. Okay, so, uh, 
So, okay, so what is this thing? So this is like the product of 2k with 2k minus 1 with 2k minus 2 and so on up to 2k minus k. Uh, and this is the same thing, but you have this uh, loss here. Okay, so this equals the product. Let's just write the first one. i equals 1 up to n of the product from j equals 1 up to k of 2k minus j. And the k factorials cancel because it's the same. Right. divided by 2k minus w i minus j. Right. Now, oh, what am I doing? Oh, now, uh, now I get rid of the j's because uh, if I have a larger number minus j divided by some smaller number minus j, then this is going to be bigger. So let me just write i equals 1 up to n, product for j equals 1 up to n. Oh, then 2k by 2k minus wi. OK, so, so, that, so that's going to be at most. So now it doesn't depend on j anymore. So it's uh, to the k this much. Okay. And now, <coughs> oh, and now I use this fact. Okay. So there are at least, there are at least n by 2 of the indices, which are such that this number is large-ish. And if this number is large-ish, then if this number is large, then this makes this denominator small, which makes the whole thing larger. So, you know, let's suppose that this is w1 up to wn by 2. It could be some others, but it doesn't make any difference. So this is at least the, the product from i equals 1 up to n by 2 of 2k by 2k minus these wi's. But now I replace this with, uh, with a thing that is smaller. Okay to the 1 minus 2 delta. Why? You know, if this is smaller than this, then, uh, then this thing is larger, making the whole thing smaller. So this side has to be smaller than this side. And now we're almost done. So, oh, oh. Uh, and now it doesn't depend on i anymore. So, you know, so it's this thing to the k times n plus 2, n by 2. Done? No. Ah. Oh, and now we do an approximation. So, okay. So this thing, so let me, I'm just going to keep this next to me. I did this once. But. Okay, so now, now this is 1 plus something, right? So what is that? So, so this um, equals 1 uh, plus k to the 1 minus 2 delta divided by 2k minus k to the 1 minus 2 delta, k n by 2. Right, k n by 2. Uh, let's, make, let's maybe just focus, let's maybe just, so, so this equals, so let's maybe just forget about the n by 2 for now, let's just focus on this thing. I'm aiming for some approximating e somehow, or something. Right, right, right. Okay, so this is some uh, right. Well, okay. All right. I guess. Uh, yeah, we have time actually, but but okay, but uh, but you know, so so you know, this basically uh, basically I lose this, I guess. So give me just a second. I should at least explain to you why it's true. You can write that say, and we would believe you. All right. All right, all right, all right. So blah, blah, blah. So this is bigger than 2 to the k to the 1 minus 2 delta by 2. That's uh, Do you believe me? <laughs> so, you know, so, so what I do is you, you multiply ab above by, the, by this thing, and it's inverse. 
uh, sorry, by this thing and its inverse. And the inverse disappears, you get 2, presumably, so, um, or at least E or something. Do you want to, sh should we do yeah, it? Or? It's, fine. it's fine, right? It's fine. Okay, good. All right, so, but what does that tell us now? That tells us that this thing is at least, you know, 2 to the half k. Uh, to the k, so to the to the one quarter n times k. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of right. It comes. Sorry, I'm kind of not here. The one I want this at least two to the one quarter uh, n k to the one minus two delta. Okay. Hence, a plus b must be at least. This is a four, not a k. This is a four. A a plus b must be at least one quarter n to the k, but b is so small that this implies that a must be at least one five n to the k. And that's how you prove it. All right? There, there you go. So that's the that's it. And now, all right. So now, so now we've proven this lower bound for the disjointness, and now we're going to do a reduction to the partial match problem. I hope we have time. I guess we. Oh, we have plenty of time. It's nine. It's seven thirty. Is when yeah. we finish. Yeah. Okay. So we have time. So okay. So now we're going to show using this, uh, and this is a reduction by Petrasco, and it shows that. Um, it shows that. Uh, So it's a reduction from this joint. So we're going to embed this lopsided disjointness problem into a partial match problem. Okay? And uh, and this will give us the following. Any so there any um, S W T scheme for partial match and D must have uh, T at least uh, D by log S or t at least d by w, whichever is smaller. OK, now let's prove it. So let's prove this. Yes. OK, so match. So match. This function takes as input a set S, which is a subset of d bit strings. and. Uh, you have any many of them, and then you have a pattern P, which is a string in zero one star okay. the D, and you want to know if there's a string in the set which uh, which matches the pattern. And now I'm going to do a reduction from the string. Let me see. I kind of forgot actually how it goes. Uh, Okay. Give me. I'm sorry. Give me two minutes. I need to remember. How it goes. So. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So so here's the idea. So so now I want to map these inputs into some set or something. So. Um, uh, okay. But what's the point then? Uh, right, so, 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 okay, so, so if I have, suppose I have this SWT scheme for matching, so this SWT scheme would give me an AB protocol for matching where A is less than, uh, 
So, so you know, so suppose that I have t both smaller than these two things. Let's say little o of these two things. Then a is going to be little o of t w, which is uh, little o of d. Correct. So little o of d, and uh, b is also little o of d. Uh, little o of uh, s log s. Uh, sorry, t log s, which is little o of d. Okay. Uh, okay. So now I have this protocol for matching, and now I'm going to give you. I'm going to try and give you a protocol for disjointness. So here's here's what's going to happen. So I have a one one two. Let's say a one two k. I'm going to encode these. Oh God! I really just don't remember how it goes. Right. So I'm going to encode. Uh -huh. Okay, so for each for each block, each block is going to correspond to an element of my set S. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. So if I want to encode this block, I'm going to encode it by. Uh, oh, let me. Okay, let D. So what's going to be D? Ooh, yes. we can, we can. So okay, so let me maybe prepare a little better. Uh, I just forgot. I should have studied a little bit uh, better. Okay, so I'll prepare this and I'll do this in the beginning of the lecture. I think that if I prepare, it will just be much faster than than you trying to do it now. It's an exercise. Huh? It's an exercise. Right, it's an exercise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Pat Patrashko says in the paper that people. So Patrasco says in the paper that people have missed this reduction for maybe 20 years or something. So there were a lot of problems trying to prove lower bounds for this pattern matching problem, you know, like for really for a long time. And everyone missed this. It was kind of a simple reduction. So again, we need to, use, to reduce this injunction to match a problem. In, uh, right. Right. So you, you're assuming a, a protocol for matching and you're building... A protocol for disjointness, protocol. Which, which will not exist or, you know... So Right. 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 So, so you're going to have to take Alice's input and encode it into some set, and then you take Bob's input and you encode it into some pattern. And you have the advantage, you know, the pattern is much smaller, but you have the advantage that uh, you have the advantage that Bob only has one bit per block. Right. Uh, whereas Alice, uh, Alice, she has more, and so maybe she needs the entire set. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it, or uh, we can do it in, the, I think that it'll take like five or ten minutes if I remember how it goes when I start. Oh, the matching problem. So, uh, S is a set where you have n strings, right. like and each of them has d bits. Yeah. And P is a pattern uh, that you want to match. So. So you kind of want to know if there's a set S, if there's an element in the set S that matches oh. the pattern. Okay. Again, I can work it out now, but uh, it's just a little bit faster. Okay. So let's do it next week. Oh, next week? No, uh, in two days from now. <laughs>